to me, she looks like Elizabeth Taylor. Beautiful. You know, we'd go shopping and people would turn to see, gosh, is that Elizabeth Taylor? Or, you know, it was neat, you know, and she had this big, huge, beautiful diamond and it just sparkled and she always wore white and she looked beautiful. Sante Times is a very intelligent uh, person, one who has a lot of energy, has seen a lot in the world, very engaging. She, she, she takes you out of your, your shell, if you have one, and, and, and has a way of, of going right inside you and bringing you out. Kenny, I met him when he was 19 years old. He was a teenager, your typical teenager. Wild, a lot of energy, raring to go, party, you know. He, he was a great kid. You know, in my eyes, he still is a good kid. Penny Kimes, to me, is the type of person where if I had a daughter, she brought him home, I'd say this man is sensational. He has it all. And he's so close to his mother. The name Kimes on the street means grifters, sleaze artists, manipulators, con people. The press is being fed information on a daily basis by law enforcement in every attempt to prevent them from getting a fair trial in this city. Sandra and Kenneth Kimes were looking forward to this day because they were looking forward to that day in court. They Watching on the news, I was shocked and disbelief. I can't believe that it's come to this. And Kenny and Shantae are behind bars. Possibly murder. It's unbelievable. This is the story of Kenneth and Sante Kimes, currently awaiting trial in New York. They are two of the most extraordinary people ever to have fallen under the spotlight of the American justice system. To the public, they are an evil con artist team capable of murder. To their lawyers and friends, they are an innocent mother and son facing life in prison. New York, July 7. Police were searching for a wealthy Manhattan widow on Tuesday after her household staff reported she had been missing since Sunday afternoon. Irene Silverman, 82, who owns and lives in an Upper East Side townhouse, was last seen Sunday morning at the home, which she rarely left without being accompanied by one of her 10 employees, police said. They said a tenant who recently moved into the building was a suspect in Silverman's disappearance, along with his mother. Kenneth Kimes, 23, and his mother Shante Kimes, 63, were a con artist team also wanted for questioning in connection with a Los Angeles homicide. Both have records for crimes, including grand larceny and robbery. This is the most exciting case and fascinating case I have covered in the last three decades. If you believe in justice or family, I beg for your help. My son and I are innocent. There is a huge evil cover-up going on. The police have made a terrible mistake and are attempting to cover up what they have done to us. My son and I were arrested on July 5th, 1998 for a crime that we did not do. I think most New Yorkers are interested in this story because uh, many people have seen the movie The Grifters and this reminds them of the movie The Grifters and um, they are looking at this mother and son who seem to be perfectly normal and the um, atrocious crimes they've been accused of and there's just pure fascination in that. This case has probably received more press coverage than any other case I've ever been involved in in my 15 years of practicing law and each and every article that has been put out by the press has been clearly slanted towards law enforcement. I'll give you an example of a headline right here. I think grifters killed her, snitch. They will use any and all to convict the Kimes. Another example, grifter grocery list, milk, bread, three dots, stun gun. 
pretrial publicity is entirely inappropriate. In a case of this magnitude, the police should at least let the jury decide the case, not the public at large, and let the evidence speak for itself. And that's what a trial is all about, not newspaper reportings. Since Irene Silverman's disappearance, the media has linked the Kimes with other murders and painted a picture of family life involving arson, deceit and fraud. For many, it's the American dream gone sour and the idea that a mother and son are capable of murder has gripped the nation. But as the bloodstains on Irene's steps are found to be from an animal, the lawyers continue to emphasize that speculation is not evidence. This is the anatomy of a frame-up. We've been making all efforts to find out what really happened, because in this case, there isn't any forensic evidence, there isn't any hair, fibers, blood, there are no eyewitnesses at all, and the police have made massive efforts to look into this, and they haven't been able to come up with a scintilla of evidence connecting the Kimeses to the disappearance and demise of Mrs. Silverman. This case isn't the case of the century, it's the case of the millennium. This case has everything. This case has mystery, intrigue, murders, socialites, millionaires. It involves exciting places like New York, Las Vegas, Los Angeles. And what's fascinating about it, it's a mother and a child. Kenneth Kimes looks at his mother. What I've noticed is that he really seems to be very uh, fixated on her, very happy and relieved to see her when he sees her. And uh, I remember the first time they came to court, they held hands for a solid hour. Um, it's a very strong attachment between those two. I've seen them uh, stroking each other and caressing each other and, and um, uh, making lovey, you know, like putting their heads together. I mean, they did this the other day in court, but they have been warned by the court offices not to do this again. Initially, the Kimes were held in prison on minor credit card fraud and denied bail eight times whilst police searched for Mrs. Silverman. Now formally charged with her murder, Kenny is incarcerated in Manhattan while Sante is detained in prison on Rikers Island outside New York. It is my great pleasure to introduce my beloved attorneys who are champions of justice and who I know will prove our innocence because we are innocent. This is Mel Sachs and this is Matthew Weissman who I dearly love. We will have other attorneys probably helping us. There's a tremendous interest. We have hundreds of attorneys that want to take this case because what this case is about is justice. So I know they will save my beloved son and I know that, that if we just are given the rights to a fair trial to a fair jury and a fair venue, that we will show the world the truth. Every effort Every, will be made yes, to make sure that a fair trial is given to you, because that's what you and your son deserve, the way any mother or any child deserves. And unfortunately, you've been mischaracterized, and there's been a rush to judgment. The police maintain that the Kimes murdered Mrs. Silverman in their master plan to steal her $10 million townhouse by forging the deeds to her property, charges denied by the Kimes. Kenneth and Sante Kimes may be innocent and may say they're innocent, but there are an awful lot of coincidences in this case. I mean, the, the documents, the, the deed, the passport, the bank books, the keys to the to her Mrs. Silverman's apartment, and also there are tapes, tapes in which Kenneth Kimes is alleged to have uh, tape recorded her, Mrs. Silverman's conversations, documenting in ledgers Mrs. Silverman's comings and goings, so that they would have an itinerary of what she did on a daily basis. Why did they do this? Do you believe that they're capable of murder? No. No. I don't think they are capable of murder. You know, I know that she, she would never hurt anybody. When I think about Irene's murder, the thing that hits me most immediately is the random quality of it. 
here is a woman, 82 years old, living in a townhouse in a sanctuary of privilege where she thought she was totally safe and discovered to our horror that she wasn't. To Mrs. Silverman's friends, her disappearance remains a powerful loss in their lives. Irene was, of course, well, she was very small. She was barely five feet tall, um, had uh, red hair, um, was always well turned out. She was a woman who was, without question, delightful, exciting, unpredictable, and always likely to come up with an adventure. Irene had, at 20 East 65th Street, created a sort of special world of her own. And it was, I think, that she was probably um, almost unable to believe that she was in danger behind these, these tall doors of her very special house. I got a phone call from my sister that Irene, according to the television station, had disappeared from her house. My reaction was one of incredulity. My puzzlement deepened and continued to deepen through to the following afternoon. When about 12 or 12.30, it suddenly hit me. Irene's never coming back. Irene is dead. She's been murdered. And I suddenly thought to myself, my God, I've known someone for 25 years, and they've been murdered. And I couldn't understand why. The little woman who is, has disappeared, if anything has ever happened to her, it's on the hands of the police. We tried to tell them that, to call our attorneys and maybe we could help, but they didn't want, the police didn't want to know of our innocence. They just wanted us to be guilty. Okay, right. just relax. You're, and the pauses are really great. They're essential. Just speak from the heart right. as you are, Kenny. Let them see who you are. You know, we know who you are, but we want the world to see you are, how you are. Let's relax. Anyone have any vodka? Right from the marketing. Okay. Just who you are. Hello. My name is Kenneth Kimes. You don't really know me. You may think you know me, but you do not. You may think you know my mother, but you don't. You have been led to think certain things about the both of us which are completely untrue. We are innocent. So come on inside my office. This is a second home to me. This is where I am most of the time, and this is a place that I really enjoy. This is a place that I spend so much time. This is a place where I speak to the Kimeses on the telephone, and it's a place that I've always wanted to be. This is the Woolworth building. When I first became a lawyer, this is the building I wanted to be in. I used to have breakfast in here every morning. I said, one day I'd love to be up in the tower. So now I'm up here in the tower. I'm overlooking the East River. I'm overlooking the Hudson River. This is where I do my legal work. This is where I see my clients. This is where I have an opportunity to relax. And this is a picture of me as a young boy. And when I look at that young boy, I see the traits that I want to retain and always have. And that's honesty sincerity, and openness, enthusiasm. And as you can see, I even have the bow tie. I even wore them then. On the morning of July the 5th, Irene did what she always did. She came downstairs, went into the front office, uh, did whatever business she had to perform. And then she decided to make herself breakfast, to have her, her tea. Around 10.30, after she entrusted her boxer, George, the last in a long line of boxer dogs that she kept, 
uh, to her to her housekeeper for a walk on the roof, she encountered Kenneth Kimes in the ground floor hallway. They argued, and Irene Silverman has not been seen since. Kenny apparently pulled a stun gun and shot her. He then apparently carried her into 1B, which is the door to the hallway, the rear apartment, which he had rented, took her inside the apartment, apparently wrapped her possibly in a shower curtain to carry her out into the trunk of the car to begin transporting her to what I believe is her likely burial place, the Jersey Meadows. When he got there, he apparently shot her, threw her body into the swamp, and there she is. I listen carefully. I listen carefully to what is being said primarily by television observers, reporters, whom I know well, who have shared information with me. Kenny then returned to the city, either picking up his mother or having had her along on the entire trip and uh, went to the hotel where he was planning to stay. Apparently was recognized by a policeman indicating that he was wanted for stealing property. John Watson is a retired detective from New Jersey who in his career found over 40 bodies in the Meadowlands. He still regularly tours the area looking for anything suspicious. If she's around here, she'll be found. Some kids walking by or a hunter, like say, when October, November comes around, people come around shooting pheasants and stuff, she'll be found. And if she's in the river, parts of her will come up to the top anyway. It's close to New York City. By land miles, it's three to five miles, and it's easy to traverse through. It comes through the bridge, Lincoln or Holland Tunnel, you have to end up in one of these two roads. Coming through the meadows, ideal spot. At night time, there's not many people around and you can see far away if a car is coming, stop and get rid of the body. And if you know, if you've passed through the location once or twice, you can, and you have this in mind, you can say, hey, that's a good spot there. Hey, that's a good spot there. And then you can pull off. Where in New York City, there's always there's a thousand eyes watching you. This is the first time in American history that officials are attempting to convict somebody for murder without a body, without one single iota of forensic evidence, not one hair sample, not one blood sample, nothing to connect Mrs. Silverman with the Kimes. We don't know where she is, but we pray for her. I pray with my son at 11 o'clock every night. We pray she's all right, but we don't know where she is, we're innocent, and if just given our rights, we will prove it. Immediately after my arrest, law enforcement underhandedly came in and stripped me naked. Law enforcement said I couldn't see my waiting attorneys. These same officers said that they were our only friends. Then after all this happened to me, I was unfairly photographed. This is the mugshot that police released to the press. A telephone call came to me from a reporter for the New York Times. And he asked, did you know anybody by the name of Kimes? And I said, oh my God, not again. That's what I was feeling. I was certainly not surprised that she'd been caught on this charge. She's always working scams from one end of this country to the other. She would look you straight in the eye and tell you that she was the queen of Egypt. 
She has absolutely no shame. Uh, she's truly amoral. She has uh, no conscience. Did I ever tell you about the $75,000 wristwatch scam? Quickly, she had it insured, and just as quickly, it disappeared out of the house. She stole a fur coat from a Washington, D.C. bar at the Mayflower Hotel. One day, she wanted to give her husband a birthday present. This is when they were living in California. So she waltzed into the Cadillac dealer in Orange County, told him he, she wanted to take a test spin. She did. She never came back. She gave that car a stolen white Cadillac to her husband for his birthday. Sante Kimes had her brushes with the law, but the brushes that she's had with the law are a far cry from murder. And unfortunately, people believe what they read, they believe what they see, and they want very much to believe that they're told that the disappearance of Mrs. Silverman was because of the Kimeses when there hasn't been any good, hard, reliable evidence to support that. Where does Sante Kimes come from? That's a big question, Mart, okay? Uh, including how, how old she is. She was either born in um, uh, 1933, 1935, I think, or 1937. And one of the places listed for her date of birth is Dust Bowl, Oklahoma, where I'm not even sure where that is. After her first marriage failed, Santi met her second husband, Kenneth Kimes. They had homes in Honolulu and Las Vegas, where their only child, Kenneth Jr., was born in March 75. Kenneth Kimes Sr. was a successful businessman who was reputedly worth $10 million when he died in 1994. Why does a woman like Santi Kimes start a career, a, a career as a criminal, even if it was a petty career? is a criminal. At the age of, of, of 26, her rap sheet dates back to 1961. They were recently caught in Florida where they were stealing, I think, $23 worth of lipsticks. Why? Her late husband allegedly left her a lot of money, had a lot of property. Why is she stealing $23 worth of, 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 of lipstick when she could probably buy out the store maybe? Once I got back to California, and was trying to collect for my services and the cost that I had um, had to represent Mr. and Mrs. Kimes over in, in Hawaii, they refused to pay. They refused to pay. They refused to answer my correspondence. They refused to um, answer the telephone and talk with me about it. I discovered that she had been using 22 different aliases throughout her lifetime. Shante Kimes, also known as Shante Singress, also known as Mrs. Uh, Ed Wilson, uh, also known as boom, 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 right down the line. She's had several marriages and relationships, so law enforcement has a habit of sometimes um, cutting out one name or the other. She's used either her married name, her ex-married name, her birth name, those are all legal names or derivatives therein. And so what's happened is that over time, it makes it look like she's used other people's names, but the majority, 99% of the names are all her names. The Kimeses are an American type who are in a way, the thing that makes you sometimes, as you look into the anonymous crowd, makes you wonder, who else lurks out there that should make me shudder? I think of the Kimeses as classic Americans, bodies without soul, bodies without heart, bodies without pity. The background of the Kimes case has been studied by a leading criminal psychologist. 
One of the most interesting things about everything that's appeared in the investigation of the Kimes up to this time is the question of who was in control, um, who was the mastermind, as it were, and who was, who was simply the pawns. And everything that's come out thus far makes it appear that she was clearly the mastermind, that she was the one who had the plan, and that she bent her son to her will. I believe that much of it was manipulation, uh, control, direction uh, from his mother, being enmeshed in a way that he couldn't escape that, and then, incidentally, trying to incorporate it in some way, uh, make it normal behavior in his own mind, justify it, so that he continues to this day to feel even more dependent on her rather than angry against her or rebelling against her or trying to separate himself from her. My mother and I had been unjustly kidnapped and held hostage for almost a year. Our lives had been ruined. Our family and friends had been tormented. This was my first Christmas away from my mother and my family. Although I would like to, I cannot speak about the specific events surrounding these issues. But the truth will come out at trial. I am not a criminal. I have no record. But law enforcement has lied to you, saying that I do. Law enforcement is painting a portrait of lies and fabrication that are being used to manipulate the media. Kenny went to school in Las Vegas. We're in St. Vitus right now, and this is the elementary school that Kenny and I attended. Kenny was just a, a, a regular boy. Um, he was just like all of us. One thing that I really liked about Kenny is that he was very inquisitive about his world and uh, about the world that he lived in, and um, I really admired that about Kenny. This is our um, 1989 yearbook of, uh, here's my entire class right here, and uh, I still keep in contact with both of these people. Um, you can see Kenny right here in the middle. He was always trying to be center of attention. He says that his favorite music group is in excess and his future plans are to become a lawyer and actor. His favorite TV show was a wise guy and of course the person that he admired most was his dad. I met Mr. Kimes many times. Mr. Kimes was always, always there in the picture. Um, he was a very uh, fun-loving father, a really concerned about his, his son's well-being and was always there for him. It seems to me that for Kenny Kimes, his father played a very significant role. He's described as a successful person, quite important in America. Nevertheless, he also appears to have taught his son never to get into the way of the mother's, Santi Kimes, desires or plans. Uh, and that's an important lesson as well, that even the successful, apparently strong father held back and never challenged his wife on activities that he had to know were taking place that were wrong. We were always very inquisitive about uh, where his mother was, but he never really shed much light on that. Um, there were times that he suggested that his, his mother was away at maybe a, a, a hospital or a mental institution or something of that nature, but it wasn't until my, until my high school years that I really found out the truth that his, his mother was uh, sent away to prison. Some time passed with no contact between the Kimes and me. One morning I opened the newspaper in the Los Angeles area and saw that they had both been arrested for slavery. They apparently had gone to this either Central America or South America or Mexico and brought back two or three girls, kept them as cleaning ladies and doing the housework around the house, refused to pay them, refused to let them out of the house. Uh, Shante would beat these women on occasion. Finally, one of them escaped and got to the police Mrs. Kimes served three years in the federal prison, I think in Las Vegas.
Kenny's house was a different place to hang out. It was like a, it was like a fun house. And I remember going over there and seeing his father once in a while, but the father was usually um, working. He was a workaholic, it seemed like. Um, but it was a very strange house. Um, a lot of sliding glass doors, a lot of, uh, a lot of TVs. You would walk into a room and there would be like three or four TVs in there, and just a bunch of them that didn't even work. Um, a lot of artifacts, paintings, um, artwork, things of that nature. Mrs. Kimes came back into the picture and everything changed. Uh, she pulled him out of, out of the school we all attended at, uh, at high, in high school and put him into a, a public high school. We all went to a private high school. And uh, we didn't really have many run-ins after that with, with Kenny. Um, he seemed very isolated over there at, at that school and at his house. Unfortunately, we didn't see Kenny much anymore um, when his mom came back into the picture. Now, she probably, in her own depraved way, loves Kenny very much. Unfortunately, it's a depraved love because she turned him into exactly what she is. I am Mike Patterson. That's. I'm the chief fire investigator of the Clark County Fire Department. Our function, our role, is to determine the origin and cause of fires. We were called in the early morning hours on January 31st to this call. When we started talking to the people in the neighborhood, because uh, we'd run the home on the assessor's records, and it came back to a Robert McCarran. But every time we talked to somebody in the neighborhood, they didn't know who my, Mr. McCarran was. They kept referring to it as the Kimes house. Later, we found that uh, Mr. McCarran was simply a front for the Kimeses. Coming up to the main entrance here, we can see that it's uh, obviously locked up since the fire. Um, and uh, looking in, you can still see you know, some pretty good damage, especially smoke damage on the second floor. Very dark, uh, still there. Needs a lot of repair. You walk in and, and it was a beautiful big living room with a piano and um, you go upstairs and there was a pink panther that always greeted you with lights. It was cute. That was just her, her way of going, you know, welcome and there would be always a note if I'd gone out the night before and I'd, you know, there would be a little note saying hugs and kisses, have a great day. In her mind, I was the daughter she never had. She had satin sheets and, and this big mirror and you know plenty of room and a couch. You'd sit and we'd talk and, and you know we'd sit there and have lunch sometimes and it was wonderful. I loved that house. But uh, our main focus was on the east side over here. Um, where we directed the majority of our investigation. And when we came through here, um, it was totally burned out. Uh, and that room inside there was totally gutted. We had two separate and distinct points of origin or areas of origin here, which is very suspicious. And who do you think started the fire? Oh, I absolutely think it was the Kimes. Uh, the Kimes has probably stood to make about $350,000. I, I think that was somewhere in the policy limit or whatever that we were informed of, uh, which is not bad for a one night's work. Having never met them, but just from what I've heard and what I've read in depositions, uh, they're scary. Uh, they, uh, there's dead bodies on this trail. There are people missing. Uh, there's a lot of fraud been perpetrated. Not the type of people you'd want for neighbors. There hasn't been any proof that the Kimeses have had anything to do with the fire. There hasn't been any arson charges lodged against the Kimeses. And there isn't any grand jury sitting in regard to arson or any criminal activities regarding their home. Again, that's something that's being used against them. There are so many public charges, but not legal charges.
When I think about Irene, there is the element of the Kimeses. How did they get to know about her? Where did they learn about her? How did they make their decisions to drive across the country from Los Angeles and Las Vegas with the specific intention of reaching New York and gaining access to a townhouse which they then intended to steal. To assure that the stealing would be final, they apparently also made the decision that they had to kill the woman who was in the house. In terms of finding out what might have happened to Irene and putting together the pieces, talk to the police, the prosecutors, members of the press, members of her staff, people who were around her, and sort of piece together this, um, this 22 days when the Kimeses lived under her roof, a few feet away from where she slept and where she worked, and they evidently bugged her telephones, spied on her conversations, broke into her office. I mean, they came into that house and hit the ground running. Just thinking about right now, I've got chills down my body. It's just, it's scary to think that, you know, is this, these people actually capable of murder? Can they take somebody's life for money? How did it get to that point? It's just very scary. Things that look suspicious don't necessarily mean that they're true. I mean, that's what the system of justice in a trial is all about, is to the search for truth. And mere coincidence is not what you will be convicted of a crime with. It has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. And there is no way that the evidence that the law enforcement officials have will convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that they are guilty of murdering Irene Silverman. When I held my son in my arms, when he was a child, I used to believe in this country. I don't believe in this country anymore. Americans are endangered. Trust me, it can happen to you. It can happen to your mother. It could happen to your son. We have done nothing wrong. The police overreacted. They are framing us. I'm mostly fighting for my son because he is my son and he's wonderful, but I'm also fighting for your son and your family. My son is a wonderful young man. He is full of goodness. He is, he is just starting his life. He is, he, his background speaks for itself. Please, please be fair. This case needs your attention and your scrutiny. I ask you, wherever you are in the world, to please carefully scrutinize these proceedings and analyze the deterioration of law and justice in America. I went to court one day uh, for one of their bail hearings. And I got there early and sat in the second row and, and I had a great seat. People get so caught up in the Kimes and the Hollywood and the, the glamour and the money and the this and the that. And they're forgetting that an elderly woman was abducted and killed. This is a person, this is a lovely human being that didn't deserve this. To be, to be carried out in a garbage bag and dumped like a piece of trash. Are you sure that we can get, my son can get a fair trial, a fair venue and a fair judge? Is there any justice left? Sante, law and order is not only finding those who are guilty, but law and order is finding those who are innocent. There have been other times when people have been arrested, indicted, brought into courts. There have been times where people who have been in prisons for years and later they find that they're innocent. There have been people sitting in the chair that you're sitting in as an accused where there's been an injustice. But Mel, we there's never been where they, this case is different, like you said, and that they don't have any evidence. This we case should have never even been. We will show that at trial, Sante. That's what a trial is about. That's the purpose of the trial. Sante, the criminal justice system is going to flourish because this trial is gonna prove that a mother and son cannot be charged falsely. You've been so mischaracterized and portrayed in the most vicious manner 
The atmosphere has been poisoned. Paula Forrester, a private detective hired by a friend of Mrs. Silverman, continues to look for her body in the Meadowlands. This area, right off of where I was parking, you can tell that somebody's been here from the way that the grass is stretched. And also these black plastic bags have always bothered me. You can tell they've been slid up the side, but there's no garbage inside. And they are open like they were connected at some point. Um, there's nothing here. There's nothing else. There's no body. But I've always found them to be very usual and been drawn to them as, as just something strange to be here. this way, you see Manhattan, where it all started. And uh, I believe Irene Silverman is underwater. And if it's not this place, it's someplace very close to here. I would really like to see the best thing for her happen. And there to be some real closure to this and the people that are truly responsible get what is due them. John Watson has not given up the search either. That's bloody. Things don't always appear the way they look. I'd like you to watch this quarter. It goes from one hand to another. And there it is. This is magic. to a jury ever to make them see that things aren't always as they seem? I do. I do it for demonstrative purposes because jurors want very much to be entertained. For instance, in a courtroom, right after the prosecutor gives his or her opening statement and the jury is all ready to convict after they know the evidence that's going to be produced, the witnesses that are going to testify, I tell the jury, can you see my hand? You think you can see it. You believe you can see it. Actually, you're unable to. Now you can see my hand. There's another side. You've only heard one side, the prosecutors. There's another side, the truth. I smell better shit than that. Yeah. We are innocent. Thank you for your time, and may God be with you. <sighs> to my family and my friends, I miss you all terribly, and I love you. I love you, Mom. Thank you. This is a fine young man with good character, with a heart, He's somebody who is deserving of fairness. He's been so wrongfully portrayed, and it's important for all those in the world to know who he actually is, as opposed to prejudging him. And unfortunately, he has been prejudged, and he has already been viewed as a criminal, and he's not a criminal. What motivates Kenneth Carnes? His mother. You know, whatever mommy says, son does, you know. I mean, she uh, manipulates him. I think this is what psychiatrists I have talked to have indicated just based on what they have read, okay? That is what they um, uh, have told me. And that what really needs to be done if to get to the bottom of what this whole thing is, is for the two really to be separated, to be questioned separated, separate 
and apart by their attorneys, but I don't think this will ever happen. To be perfectly frank with you, I feel most sorry for Kenny, because Kenny's life has never been able to begin. He's 23, and frankly, what he's involved in now may possibly ruin the rest of his life, because he will never be able to have the anonymity that you and I have. He, he is a famous person in a derogatory manner, and this will follow him for the rest of his life. That's a, that's a rip bone. Someone killed one of them ducks, threw it in there. That's from a pheasant, see it? And the other's one of the white ducks. Somebody shot it, there's three of them, one, two, three. Smell, it smell like a body. In order to prove murder, you have to establish that number one, somebody was murdered. Number two, that the cause of death was homicide. So without the body, they're unable to prove it. It hasn't even been proven that Irene Silverman has met her demise. So how are you able to prove that the cause of death was murder? Kenneth and Sante Kimes are awaiting trial on 84 counts, including murder, conspiracy, burglary, robbery, possession of a weapon and possession of stolen property, forgery and eavesdropping. They each face 131 years in prison. The whereabouts of Mrs. Silverman still remain a mystery. <laughs>